between Fong and Cahill. Good. Okay. So <laughs> we've arrived. Full circle. Yes. Rolling? Yep. Okay, we're rolling. I actually would like to start. Uh, I'll give you the choice. Uh, you, you were talked about your own arrival at Princeton and how, you, uh, how it led to you meeting uh, Jim Cato. Uh, you had also started the sentence about um, looking through your own publications. And finding Jim Cahill everywhere in it. Trying to find one where he wasn't <laughs> present. So I'll give you either of those choices. You can start with either one of them. Well, um, the first one takes me farther back in time. And I came into the field out of a PhD program in something unrelated. And that was American history, history of the South, history of the Civil War, history of um, slavery and slave codes and uh, things of that kind that landed me a job working in the United States Senate. And that unintentionally led me to the Freer Gallery where Jim had worked for a fair number of years. And I fell in love with Chinese art and just decided to divorce one field and get married to the other uh, without any qualifications and um, made a proposal in effect that I assumed would be turned down. It just happened that Jim was going on leave uh, the year that I applied to grad schools and so I didn't apply to Berkeley. I had taken the previous year off um, in effect uh, to read as much as I could uh, so that I could get some sense of the field and know where I wanted to be. And certainly Jim was a big part of that as somebody who was uh, so prolific in his writing. But I really had no qualifications to get in anywhere, and yet when Fong at Princeton accepted me, everybody else turned me down high and low. And so I came here for the better part of one year, and then my political past caught up with me and I was yanked out of school and was out for several years as a result of the Vietnam War. And um, went back to uh, the West Coast, which I knew best. Can you, can you uh, start that sentence again? And, went back. <clears throat> and then I went back to the West Coast, which was, I guess, the part of the country that I felt most comfortable with and knew best and got a master's degree and finished up at Stanford, all of which um, I did without ever, I think, once meeting Jim. And I wrote a dissertation that would never have been permitted at Princeton and um, received a lot of negative feedback in those days because it was so highly politicized, which was really not welcome in the field. Uh, this was not a field of social history. This was not a field of political history. This was a field of art history for the sake of art history. And that meant style, the study of style, its language, um, and it was all about itself. Jim was in the vanguard of those people who knew the language of style as a vocabulary for talking about other things. And um, the first occasion we had to meet that I can remember was a symposium in Hong Kong in 1976, I think it was. And it was the first time I had a chance to present my work. And it went over very badly. And it was because the audience did not like the direction that it was taking. 
and the one person who stood up to defend it in principle was Jim. He said, you know, if <laughs> this rides on the facts, if... Hey, Chica. I had written a dissertation about a very prominent artist who lived during the time of the Manchu invasion of China. And uh, he was a bit of a mystery biographically. Um, but very prominent because of the strength of his art. And um, people, I think, had had a sense that the dark nature of his art was due to the difficulties of maintaining a career in a moment of revolutionary upheaval in China. And they alluded to that, and that seemed to be old and adequate, but to get more specific than that, which is what I tried to do, and I think managed to do with the help of the fellow's own writings, um, was to take his art across a line that had never been clearly established, but was still there. And that was to say that iconographically, this was more than just mood, that this was what today one would call semiotically, speaking to an audience about specifics. And um, that some of his motifs were actually iconographically detailed in reference to the Manchus, the foreigner invader, um, the chaotic structure of his landscape paintings and so forth. And um, the field was predicated on the notion, somewhat unspoken, but I think Jim Cahill understood it theoretically more articulately than anyone else did, including myself, that painting was intended to serve as a kind of cleanser to a social class that was inherently political. They were the bureaucrats of China. They were the servants of the state. That was their distinction within the Chinese framework. And the understanding was that the politics of their daily life would be, in effect, cleansed by their artwork, rather than the other way around, that the artwork would not be polluted by the dirt of their politics. And so what I've said, in effect, was headed in the opposite direction and suggesting that this dark and somber mood, especially by being intended as something more than just, hey, I'm feeling grumpy and having a bad day, but actually designed to promote other people's antagonism or express a deep-seated specific antagonism within the political realm actually cross that line. And I predicated that on writings that took a long time to dredge up for this fellow, in part because he was um, unacceptable in his own time by the court, in as much as throughout the remainder of his life, he maintained his loyalty to the fallen dynasty. Well, Jim was the one person who stood up 
in the audience, he was a participant, but in the audience, and said, if that's there in the writing, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, it's there, and it must uh, be accepted. It was a conference that was focused on this generation of artists. And so I went into it naively, assuming that there would be lots of presentations like my own that would relate the politics of the day to the art of the times. And in fact, there was only one slight hint of that in one other paper, which was by Ju Ting Lee from University of Kansas. And the rest of it was still art for art's sake. And I was really quite surprised by that, having come out of a background of political history, dealing with an entire class of people whose profession was to operate in the political realm. Um, somehow it had not crossed my naive mind that they were supposed to keep their art and their politics separate, and even if that was never quite recorded as a rule of behavior, it was there, it was accepted as the appropriate um, mode of operation. And we had no way of accounting for those occasions when it seemed to be violated. And I was bringing forth, in effect, that case um, with literature to bear that was breaking the code of behavior. And the scholarly audience was effectively saying, no, you can't do that. And Jim was saying, well, maybe you can. And it really depends on the literary evidence. Ultimately, that came to be accepted. Um, ultimately, that broke down a lot of barriers in the field. The Jim himself was already very much engaged in breaking down in a more subtle way, a less naive way. And that was to take um, the art in the direction of a kind of social history. Jim's position in all of that was to argue that expectations on the part of different groups and classes within the society had different taste, patronized different kinds of products. Occasionally, one might be so clear as to say, patronized different kinds of artists. And he met a lot of resistance, too. And so, in a sense, um, we found ourselves as fighting the same cause against the same people. And it wasn't simply that it was personalized, because I think Jim was an exquisite diplomat, and I tried always to be as diplomatic as I could be about this, but it was a serious and legitimate issue, scholastically, to deal with the question of what the discipline itself is all about, what it should be about, and where it should be going. And I think that there was a strong sense on the part of many of the people in the field, most importantly, those who came from Princeton and were teaching all around the country, uh, that they did not want to see this become a social history of art. Um, Dick Barnhart at Yale uh, was perhaps the most articulate with regard to that. He 
quite literally said to Susan Bush in a College Art Association conference panel that I was chairing in, um, I think it was New York or Boston, I think it was 1986, he said if you, to Susan, if you want to do this kind of work, you should be in a different department. You shouldn't be here and it doesn't belong in our field. And I think things had progressed to the point at that late date that the bulk of the scholars who were present no longer found that kind of statement acceptable. They had crossed the same line that Jim and I and increasingly others were crossing in our own work. And which is normative today in this field, um, which is to say that that language of style is not simply about itself. Um, it's a language that can talk about all kinds of things. It's a vocabulary, it's a grammar, um, but it's not linguistics. And in effect, um, the field was stuck on linguistics at the time that I came into it. Art was about art, it was about itself. It was an internal, self-limiting dialogue. And I don't think anybody did as much to change that as Jim did. And I think that in retrospect, I see him as doing that because he was essentially, I would say, a people person. I think he was more, well, and I would say this about myself as well, which is why we got along so well, and I got so much of the benefit of his mentorship, was that he was not interested in art for its own sake. He was interested in the people who made it, and why they made it, and who they made it for, and how it was used. And this is what came out increasingly over time in his prolific writings. And I think if you knew him as a person, you knew he was exquisitely a people person. He was the most affable and um, articulate and communicative guy you could know. Um, you might say he was Irish or something like that, but um, he was certainly deeply engaged with people, um, a completely enjoyable human being, regardless of where you were coming from in terms of any scholastic interest. And um, there was a kind of unity between his personality and his work interests. And I think that's where it lay. It lay in his interest in people and how they used art, how they saw art, uh, how they produced art. And I don't think he was capable of just looking at art for its own sake, at art as something that one hung on a wall or simply in isolation, looked at as a scroll on a table and appreciated only for aesthetic satisfaction. I think the Chinese were capable of that. I don't think Jim was. I know I wasn't. Um, there was always more to the story than that. Uh, today's students, the bulk of today's teachers would take that for granted. But that was a fight that had to be fought. Uh, Jim, maintained over a few years quite an extensive written dialogue, you might say debate, with Dick Barnhart. They went back and forth. Um, Jim's student, Howard Rogers, participated in it. Um, I participated on the edges of it and didn't want to be directly engaged in it. I still have a lot of my correspondence that only went back and forth 
between Jim and myself, but Jim, Dick Barnhart, Howard Rogers correspondence was ultimately published, um, or at least distributed, let's say. I'm not sure that it ever got a legitimate commercial or academic publisher. Um, but it's very important writings for anybody who wants to know how this field developed over the last generation, how it got to where it is. And those were the terms of the debate. Can you, can you um, touch on some of the points of the content of the, of the debate between Barnhart and Cato, just so we have an understanding of what, the, what they were arguing about? <clears throat> if you can condense it somehow. They were talking about the art of a slightly previous generation, um, primarily the 16th century, Ming Dynasty in China. They were not talking politics so much as they were talking social class, a differential between the dominant social class in China, the scholar class, the scholar gentry, um, which was engaged uh, both in politics and in art. And art was more at that moment, perhaps, than any other defined, um, I would say, as art for art's sake. And there was probably, most fundamentally at that moment in time, an awareness of the distinction that had emerged over the past couple of centuries between those people who painted as amateur artists, what today in the West we might call Sunday painters, and that class of people, which in China was a lower class, we translate this as artisans, um, who painted as professionals, who painted on commission, or at the local level would have maintained a, probably a mounting studio uh, where paintings might have been sold or traded or commissioned uh, for production. We know terribly little about that um, latter practice because so little was written about it that could survive, be preserved for us to understand today. Jim was exquisitely interested in that. And um, I think that Dick Barnhart, probably like him, Wen Fong, but Wen didn't enter as directly into the debate. I'm sure that he was there on the sidelines, rooting, maybe coaching. Uh, he and Dick were very close together. Um, and their point of view was that you couldn't make this discrimination. And you certainly couldn't do it just by looking at the art. That, that discrimination that Jim was talking about might be there as a stylistic difference, but you could find artists who were all over the place. And there was no fine line, there was no categorical distinction. It was a far more complicated reality than Jim was seeing it as being. And they certainly had a strong argument to make. Both sides did, and it was a challenge to sort things out. I think that underlying their point was that if you couldn't make the fine discrimination that Jim was trying to make, then it, in effect, was saying that's not the direction to focus the attention of the field itself, that it was a distraction from where we ought to be, and what we ought to be doing. I think it's important to keep in mind for those people who were supremely concerned with style and 
the linguistics, let's say, of the field, that this was a field of study that was very much complicated by lingering uncertainties about the authorship and the dating of works, major works, um, works that filled the museum collections, that one could say it came for this period or that period and you couldn't be quite sure. And they felt that the primary responsibility of their generation was to resolve those dating issues. That without <clears throat> that resolution, without knowing for sure, in most cases, who it was done by and when it was done, and to be able to talk about a large enough set of works that represented any given period or group of people stylistically, that until those sets were in effect firmed up and resolved, that you could not conduct a credible history, that you could not build a history on such uncertain foundations. And so I think they felt that people like Jim were getting ahead of the field, too far ahead of the field and that this was undermining what the field really needed to be doing, that it was attracting perhaps too many people in that direction when we ought to still be dedicating the bulk of our efforts to that stylistic development. So, so this, uh, there, there's some spectacular cases of the disagreements over the, over the dating and Well, there are, but I don't think that that was really quite as central to the period of time that Jim and Dick were arguing about. Um, there was certainly to be found lots of paintings that one could argue about the dating of, but that was a period and I think Jim felt this, for which there was so much that was known. There was such good documentation for so many works that we had a pretty clear sense of what was what. And I think that it is probably, as he got involved in writing a sequential set of books about the history of later Chinese painting, as he happened to move into this period of time. I think he felt that he had arrived at that moment in time where the material sustained the argument. And so I think he felt, now I'm on solid ground. And that was where he put this forth. In a sense, this was like a shot over the bow of those who didn't want to go there. And in a sense, it helped to define the field itself. As those who were ready to go there, happy to go there, prepared to say, this is where we want to end up, as opposed to those people who, it's a little hard to say, but I think just weren't looking that far down the line or hadn't defined what might be out there for themselves. They were happy doing what they were doing. They were not happy seeing other people do something different. And something that Jim was always very clear about. You didn't have to be doing what he was doing. You didn't have to agree with him. He was not ready to go to battle over differences of point of view, or intention, or methodology. If you were doing something different, it was only a question of whether you were doing it well or not. And I think that he demonstrated 
a kind of scholastic tolerance that the field at that point in time badly needed. And I think it was that a person of his ability and stature signaled that to the whole field. That made an enormous difference in its historical development. I don't think that Princeton, as a leader in the field, shared, expressed, consciously promoted that interest in diversity, toleration for it. And I think in some regards, you might say that that was maybe Jim's greatest contribution was to open up the field to a much broader array of methods, types of investigation, and to say, it's not a question of whether you do that or not, it's only a question of how well you do it. Can, can you talk more specifically about the disagreement between Len Fong and Jim over various questions? Uh, in the sense that there was something <laughs> that one is gone and one is no longer about to return, that this is a good time to maybe open the subject up. You know, it's possible to say that Jim and Wen got along famously despite differences. Um, they always managed to be able to sit down and talk to each other. Um, but there's no overlooking the differences that they had. And they were absolutely fundamental. It's possible to say that they differed on everything. And they differed on how they saw everything. They differed on how they saw each other. I remember coming back from a conference session that was held here at Princeton in the late 90s. And at the end of a panel session, everybody had wandered off, and the only people left hanging around were Jim and Wen, and for some reason myself, and Cao Xingyuan. And Wen said, I think we didn't know where everybody else was going to lunch. And Wen, being local, said, hey, let's go off to Prospect House over there. I didn't even know they were open on a weekend. Um, maybe they weren't, because I don't remember eating anything. I remember sitting down at a table, big round table, with Jim on one side of me and Wen on the other, and they did all of the talking for the next hour, and I wish to God I had a tape recording of it, because their whole conversation was about their relationship. And it sort of boils down to whether their relationship was healthy and healthy for the field. And they argued about that because <laughs> they argued about everything. And you, if you know them, you wouldn't have to guess who was taking what position. Um, when thought that their disagreements were just what the field needed and had served the field well, and they'd managed to be such wonderful friends, um, despite differences in outlook. And uh, there were a lot of things that Jim could have said that day that he didn't. But his point of view was that he'd wish their relationship had been a whole lot better and a whole lot nicer and a whole lot better for the field. 
and that it hadn't served the field all that well. And I think um, that the unspoken part of that, which I heard not infrequently when it was one-on-one -on -one from Jim, was that Princeton uh, had been all-powerful when it came to the issue of the job market, that being East Coast as opposed to being West Coast, Californian, that Wen was in a position with his teaching at Princeton and his curatorship at the Metropolitan Museum to place virtually every one of his students in a good position, whereas Jim himself had only managed to place his students, for the most part, in either second tier positions or if they were good positions, they were still only West Coast. I think the single thing that rankled him the most was his student Howard Rogers, who is a, just one superb scholar, as good as it gets. And um, Howard couldn't get a major position anywhere in the country, as far as I know. I wasn't party to these things back when they were happening, but um, Howard ended up, after not getting one position that Jim had wanted for him and that I think Howard would have been not only well qualified for but quite happy with, left the country and went to Japan and um, was uh, over there for a long period of time instead of being one of the leading contributors um, to the production of students here. And um, Howard had to make his own way, which he did exquisitely well in his own terms. Um, but that was very different from his training a generation of followers along certain methodological and intellectual lines as Wen had managed to do so well, and as Jim had managed to do not quite so well, not because of the students, but because of the nature of local politics. And I think that that bothered Jim enormously. I think that he saw it as foul play. I think he could never quite bring himself to say that openly, directly, to Wen Fong. Was all this the result of, of some of, of disagreement over, over the content of the art, or was it a, a deeper disagreement about the stylistic I think it was all a question of what do you do with the art? What is this field all about? What's it for? What are its goals? What should we be doing now as opposed to later? Question of timing. Um, whether we had a substantial enough foundation yet to be making the kind of claims that Jim was making about social class, which I think some people must have felt sort of smacked of Marxism. And Jim was anything but a Marxist. Um, or about politics, which I was making. And um, I think they just weren't ready for the next stage. I think myself, that next stage was inevitable. And I didn't see anything wrong with being there at that point in time. It was very hard to do, though, because those things still needed to be defined. And maybe it's not surprising that it was both difficult to come up with the first definitions, and in a way, I would say I did so perhaps naively, 
without as good a grasp of some of the old Chinese attitudes that one could intuit but maybe never find so clearly written as to say, here's what we mean to tell you. Um, but I think it is that underlying question of intent that was the basis of most of the disagreements. It was only on certain occasions where there were major disagreements about major works. That got lots of attention. And I, maybe I'm not putting two and two together very well, but that may be a rather different matter from the other matters. Well, will you talk about where we're back? I don't know that the differences between them between Jim and Wen didn't somehow contribute to the levels of disagreement that were expressed, but I don't think that they were central to it. Um, it is a bit hard for me to understand, despite all of our communications about it, and they were extensive, why Jim saw that painting as he saw it. This was not a question of politics or social class, what one is doing with the art, this was a purely stylistic, connoisseurial issue. This was playing with Wen Fong on his home field. This was not challenging the field. Um, I'm not sure that it was challenging the methodology. I think it was challenging maybe the common sense that underlay it. And I think that there is a question of where we ended up in the debate. That if we don't understand that, and I'm not sure that I do, that we can really understand quite what it was all about. Um, but in the long run, Jim was certain that he had won the debate and that he had convinced most people, but that they were not willing to admit defeat, and so that they just shut up because from his point of view, they were intimidated. And when was sure that the debate had been settled on his side, um, though the fact is that the debate began with the claim that this particular painting was by this famous artist, fundamentally important painting as a result of that because we're not sure if there are any other authentic paintings by him, Dong Yuan by name, and that this was an authentic Dong Yuan painting, signed Dong Yuan, of the place, of the time. And the Metropolitan Museum no longer stands by that claim. It is now attributed 
to Dung Yuan, which is the Metropolitan's label for it, and that means that the Metropolitan Museum itself is not willing to stand by the signature, and if they don't stand by the signature, then who is it really by, when is it really done, and even what is its geographical origin in a period of time when art was highly localized and very much the product, landscape arts in particular, of the place that it came from, as well as the time. And so, um, I think everybody has their own view about that, and I'm not sure that most people know much more than their own view. Do you have a view? I have a view. Um, I only have a very intuitive view of other people's attitude. Um, Jim was, as I say, absolutely convinced that most people had no choice but to see things his way and he couldn't understand why they didn't and why they didn't admit it. My view is um, that most people don't share his point of view, that very few people trained in the field share his point of view, which is the claim that this is a, 10 centuries later than that artist, 10 centuries. Of course, if we can be a thousand years off with regard to a work, then that old issue that we talked about of whether we have a secure enough base to use the language in more than a purely linguistic way is yet possible. And in a sense, Jim was fighting against his own cause. He was undermining that base at the same time that he was arguing that the base was secure. And I don't think he ever put that together in his own mind. Not to say that if he had serious doubts about that, that he shouldn't have pursued them. In the sense, once again, that if we could be wrong about a painting that represented ultimately the most influential artist of all time, and that we could be wrong by a thousand years, that we didn't quite know what we were talking about in terms of stylistic history and that until we had a secure stylistic history, we couldn't use that as the foundation for a social or political history. And I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, and I never said it to Jim, I don't know why, that this is something that um, fuels that old debate that you had with Dick Barnhart and somewhat unspoken with Wen Fong about the social history of art. But it did have that impact, um, at least theoretically. I don't know that anybody has made much of it, but maybe the strange thing is that for all of the uh, smoke that this debate generated, and I think it ultimately contributed greatly to when retiring from the Met, not entirely when he wanted to, um, that it didn't produce much real results, that it didn't change anything, it didn't change things the way Jim wanted them to, 
be changed, and I don't think that people have made much of it. I don't think it's left a significant impact in our thinking about the field. Should it have? <laughs> um, well, if Jim was right about it, yes, it should have. It should have made a big difference. And in a way, it would have made a rather negative difference, I would say, from his own point of view. I think I feel intuitively that most people in the field, and there are a few exceptions, regard it as a very early painting, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 14th century at the very latest. The notion that it's a 20th century pastiche, and in particular, by Zhang Da Qian, as he has suggested, it just it's hard for people, including myself, to understand. I I cannot wrap my head around that, and I've certainly tried hard for a long time. Um, the irony in it is, I think, expressed in another debate that took place, not nearly as visibly, but between Jim and myself and a few others, who by and large had been agreeable, let us say, partners in a certain kind of approach over several decades of time. And um, this was generated by an article that Jim published with regard to, in effect, state of the field, where he complained loudly and somewhat bitterly that we had abandoned that stylistic pursuit of the earlier generation. And that sounded more like Wen Fong to me than it did like Jim Cahill. It was as if he had somehow reversed course. It was an article that he had written, I forget how much earlier, but he gave it to Marsha Haufler, who had been one of his students and who was the uh, editor-in-chief at the time of one of the major journals um, archives of Asian Art. With a request that she publish it. And she had doubts about whether it ought to be. I think she felt it was sort of old stuff and people weren't going to be interested in it. And I concurred as a member of the editorial board, and I thought we'd seen the last of it. And then a few months later, I heard back from her that she decided to publish it, and she wondered if I would write a response to it. And it turns out that I wrote one of two responses to it. Um, our colleague Bob Harris at Columbia wrote another, and um, I used it, I guess, as a springboard to talk about a lot of things that were on my mind at the time um, that also, you might say, reversed course, whereas um, I felt and feel that we have a solid enough foundation to move forward on all fronts. I'm not quite sure how solid it has to be. And so while Jim was sounding rather Fong-ish in terms of challenging 
the security of our dating. I was suggesting that using a particular area in time that had always very much engaged me, which was the Sung to Yuan transition and the way that Princeton had dealt with that as constituting an enormous change in direction, which could only be explained by a change in politics and society, um, that I thought that they were drawing much too sharp a contrast in doing that, that looking at the works that were out there didn't substantiate their argument on those grounds. And the irony of that is, and I don't think I spelled that out too clearly, but the irony of that is that that reverses course too that, in effect, that was Princeton using socio-political terms that they were telling Jim and others not to engage in. And so it was pointing out inconsistencies within the field that, in effect, were all over the place. Despite what people thought they were doing, what Jim thought he was doing on one side of this dotted line, what Wen and Dick Barnhart and others thought they might be doing on another side of that line. We weren't where we thought we were. And we weren't really staking out entirely consistent positions. Whether we were consistent or not doesn't bother me. What bothers me was uh, the question, and the way I posed it, in effect, was the question of whether we were letting the facts shape our point of view or letting our point of view shape the facts that we were using selectively, whether it shaped our selection of the facts. <clears throat> Howard uh, uh, Rogers uh, told us that right at this time in the, in the uh, field, uh, authenticity is really a very important question. Now, still. Now, now more than mm -hmm. before, you know, because of things surfacing and difficulties in, in tracking down what they are. Um, is is that, uh, is it an academically important area as well as uh, collectors, important, important to collectors? Or does it seem to sort of reverberate with these arguments that you I think what I'm describing in talking about inconsistency is that sometimes people are actually playing on parts of the field they don't even recognize as being theirs and where they say they don't want to be. What I appreciated always so much about Jim was his willingness to sit and listen to any argument. He never closed his mind to an argument. And my point of view was always that in moving forward methodologically and in terms of what do we intend to use this art to say, that that didn't mean that we moved on and closed down that initial set of concerns that that work needs to go on too. 
And so I never saw myself as being antagonistic to either side when people sometimes felt they were taking sides. I felt that all of that work needs to take place. Jim's concern was that we were ceasing to engage in that original task of dating, dealing with connoisseurial questions. And I think that he too never saw himself as opposing that undertaking, but only opposing the opposition to moving on from it, to moving outward in addition to it. And I very much agree with Howard that there's still a lot of work that needs to be undertaken, especially given in the last 25 years or so, the enormous amount of art that is only being reproduced and published for the first time in China after the end of that Maoist era. Um, that there's so much work that has to be dealt with in terms of placing, contextualizing, in terms of time, location. Um, but there's another factor and I think that that other factor is ultimately what was motivating Jim in that article. And it may actually have been a subtle expression of intolerance, to use that word, on his part. I think that his complaint unspoken, was being directed against those people of a younger generation whose primary motivation is neither connoisseurial and maybe from his point of view also not a kind of social history, but rather more theoretical. And I think that he is looking at the phenomenon that a lot of people in the classroom today effectively stay in the classroom and don't go into the museum on their own or with their students and aren't looking at art except in reproduction and are not interested in objects. Jim, in his career, combined curatorial work, beginning at the Freer, with classroom work at Berkeley, and he never stopped, in effect, doing both. He was always looking at work. He had an enormous visual vocabulary with tremendous visual recall ability. And I think that he was very upset with people of today's generation who did not feel particularly motivated to take the time that he thinks it takes to just be looking and waiting for things to happen that happen only when you're looking at a real work of art in detail that don't happen at your desk, that are of a very different order from what happens between the object and your desk, your computer. He didn't say that, but I think that's what he had in mind. Um, can we talk about Jim Cahill, the man? You you know what his influence on you and how he how he influenced you. I think you were getting there because you yeah. were talking about looking. Yeah, the way yeah. Of looking and everyone sure. says that this way of looking is one of his was one of his greatest qualities. His way of looking at pieces. Well 
you know, you look at a work of art, there's so much to see. Um, I was never convinced that the school of style was all that good stylistically. Um, I'm not sure I should say this, uh, but my first book, which was uh, really written not for my fellow scholars, but just for students on how to look, what are you looking for? And just what is the kind of training that your eye needs? that your mind needs to direct the eye. What are you looking for? Um, was a result very early on of that feeling that I didn't feel people were looking all that well. And that as I would read published work, Either we were seeing very different things in looking, um, which is okay with me if they're there, but far too frequently we were seeing things very differently to a degree that's acceptable because we know people see things differently. We process. It's not just optics, um, it's mental. At the same time, I had the feeling that at that level where we could really talk about just optically, what's there that we ought to be able to agree on the fundamentals of the visual language and the use of it, that we were doing a pretty crummy job of that. And um, I think Jim's ability was often um, not just at the level of that vocabulary, but to be able to pull things out that other people weren't seeing. And by and large, he did a very fine job of that. Um, but he stood up for a lot of people at a time when the field was really ready to expand rapidly and for a lot of different approaches. I mentioned how he really stood up, in my case, for a particular approach when it was meeting a lot of very overt, I mean really <laughs> articulated hostility. Um, I had a friend who was there at Hong Kong at the time, who said, you ought to hear what these people are saying about you, and I know you don't speak Cantonese. Um, and they're saying it in the local dialect, and my response was, I'm glad I don't understand what they're saying. Um, but when I came down for this talk with you, I grabbed a few things off of my shelf that I thought might be of interest, and a lot of those things are things that probably wouldn't be there if not for Jim. Or things where, in some cases, he was there first. And um, one of them was a article that I wrote that's probably, if people in the field know anything or remember anything that I've actually written, because we read this stuff, and often forget it pretty quickly. It was a state of the field essay that I wrote back in 1987. And I think it was probably the first thing that I wrote, even though I'd been in the field for well over a decade that anybody paid much attention to. Um, and Jim was the person who got the first offer to write this from the Journal of Asian History, which is the representative um, 
publication for the whole field of Asian studies. And he didn't want to be bothered with it. He had too much else to do. He was writing that series of um, histories of Ming, and it was going to continue on into the Qing period. Never got completed. And so he recommended me to do it. And, and I did. <laughs> that was that, at any rate. Um, I'm looking at publications on C.C. Wong. Um, both he and Wen Fong dealt extensively with C.C. Wong, who had his own way of looking that was different from either of them. Wen Fong was looking for structures. Jim was looking for forms of cultural expression. C.C. Wong was just into production, and you produce all of this with a brush. So he was just looking at brushwork, brushwork, brushwork. And to me, all of these things add up. They don't detract from each other. You don't argue against them. Um, you can't do everything, so you do your part. You play your part in an orchestra, and you listen to the music, and you recognize that if you're playing drums, you still need the brass, and you listen to the overall contribution. And so I n never really grasped why people were so um, differentiating in an antagonistic way. You gotta do it my way, you gotta play my instrument only. Um, that never quite made sense to me. Um, but that came forward in Riverbank. Jim saw it one way, Wen saw it another way, C.C. Wong saw it a third way. And that finally brought this level of disagreement way out into the open like it had never done before. There'd been little moments when the New York Times or whatever um, would pick up on this kind of thing, um, including the first time around that Wen Fong bought 25 paintings from CC for the Metropolitan Museum. And um, some people doubted whether they were authentic, and since this was public money, it became a public issue, and different specialists, including Sherman Lee, um, Tom Lawton from the Freer, and Larry Sickman from Kansas City were brought in to give their evaluations with the promise that those evaluations would remain private, and it took about two minutes for them to become public. And the Times picked up on that in 1974 or something like that. But, you know, that's still background kind of stuff. This got much more attention. And when this, uh, and, and it was another revisitation of a purchase from C.C. Wong with public monies. And it drew enough attention that the Metropolitan and the Department of Asian Art felt that they had to air it publicly, and we filled the place. There were a thousand people there, and I don't know how many people couldn't get in, um, but that place was jam-packed, and there were uh, correspondents all over the balcony uh, recording it, and what they were picking up on was this field was busy arguing with itself and couldn't tell a painting from 10th century to yesterday, just didn't know what it was talking about. And that made exciting news, I guess, for anybody who read um, the arts section, and I think this made it all the way onto the front page um, with the sense that Chinese painting studies hasn't advanced very much since the 1970s. Well, of course it has. 
Um, but taken out of context, you could argue otherwise. Um, I wrote a book review very early on in my career because somebody asked me to, Journal of Asian Studies, and I thought, well, Journal of Asian Studies, I'll do that. Um, I immediately regretted having said yes because I didn't like the book at all. It was a translation, and it was a very poor translation that shouldn't have been published and really wasn't worthy of being reviewed. I should have been sophisticated enough at the time to go back to the editor and say, let's just not publish a review of this. It really isn't worthy of note. Um, or the editor, after I wrote my review, said, this is negative enough that let's not go with it. Um, I don't like being negative, and I don't like telling other people bad stuff. I'm certainly not, you shouldn't have published this, or you shouldn't be taking that approach, or whatever. The result of which is I said that's it for me in book reviews, and I didn't write another book review for a very long time. It was over a decade before I did, and it was uh, to review the second book in Jim's series. The second? Rather, the third. And the only reason I did it was that I thought that the review that had been produced of the second by Dick Barnhart um, had been very unfair and had taken some of his comments out of context and um, in effect had taken that argument we were talking about with regard to um, 16th century painting and blowing it up out of proportion all over again. And so I agreed to review the next in the series only because I saw it as an opportunity to talk about that book, um, the fourth as well as, uh, the third I should say, as well as the second, and to revisit that earlier review. They're not going to stop for the next 20, 30 minutes. I think we've got a okay, break there. Uh, yeah, we have to, we have to, uh, let's, let me try to pull a summary statement out of this. Yeah. Because I think it's going to do about Jim Cable and his importance to the Asian Studies Journal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 If you talk about Princeton Berkeley, which in effect in academics were really the two poles of the field, I think it's very much fair to say that Princeton dominates the field with its production of scholars. Wen Fong really did a wonderful job in terms of attracting fine, talented people and discriminating in his choices. Um, and in placing them in museums and classrooms on three continents. Um, Jim Cahill made his mark differently. He had certainly fine students, and I wouldn't say anything negative on that score, but he didn't place them all around the world. Um, what he did was to place his books all around the world, on bookshelves everywhere. And he was an incredibly fine writer. Um, actually, he changed my way of writing. He didn't adopt a dry scholastic tone, but wrote as if he was talking to you, the reader. And you felt like, he was listening to you, too. He just had the ability to account for his readers. 
and to articulate complex issues so that people outside of the field could read and understand. And in doing so, um, he took the field beyond itself. He did that through a combination of writing skills. He sometimes said that he wrote too well, that he could convince people of things that weren't true if he needed to. He had greater doubts than his readership did sometimes. Um, but he also really had something to say in that sense that he was on the cutting edge of applying art and its language in China to the broader questions of who did it, why'd they do it, what were they trying to say, who were they saying it to, and what was the audience thinking of what they said. And he was able to put all of those things between two covers and share it with a far wider audience than comes into the classroom. And so I think he's left an indelible mark on the field, primarily for his writings um, and everything that those writings represent. Mm. Well, you remember I said there's a lot of things I don't want to say. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, Off camera. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, all the things you didn't want to say. That's that. Uh, no, is there any, any other area? Oh, I think I've said a lot, and you can boil this down to a couple of clips that take a, a minute or so. Oh, there were three or four very nice. Uh huh. You know, there was this uh, late Jim Cahill question uh, the, when we had so much correspondence over Riverbank. This, this is just for us because you continue on with this. I pulled down the titles of some of Jim's correspondence with me um, through emails, a favor to ask, a long one on a familiar subject, desperate query. Please fill me in. Huge revelations sprung. Very urgent. More of the same. More on more of the same. Outpouring by Jim Cahill. Things, things of that kind. Um, he'd say, I don't know why I'm writing to you except that I have to write to somebody and you are more, most likely to respond understandingly to what will be an outburst and not let it out to anyone else, as I certainly don't want to do. <laughs> so I'm not about to do that. But he did have a lot of frustration in the last several years. Um, it, as I said, he was a real people person. And in retiring, um, he lost a great deal of that audience. You can't see your readers. And he felt more isolated than he really was, especially when health issues became a factor, um, when he couldn't literally walk around and get around as easily as he used to. And he really badly missed not just having an audience, but having an engagement with people. He was a real back and forth person. He was a wonderful listener. And I think the last several years were really difficult for him. I think that as much as anything, um, I, I'm sure he felt very sincere about the Riverbank issue. And it went all the way back to his early years at the Freer, when he took a leave of absence for a year. And during that time, they acquired a fake early painting that was by Zhang Da Chen, and he got very 
interested in Zhang Dachen as forger. He got to know him and so forth. Um, he carried that with him all the way through. And he learned a lot about it, and I think that he felt very sincere in regard to Riverbank. But I think that in the end, it became a mode of engagement. He wanted to stir the pot, and he wanted to see that it had an effect. And when it had no effect, when he couldn't get people to respond and engage with him over it, I think he felt the height of frustration that he could not generate that intellectual rapport that he really had deep down loved. Him and Dick Barnhart, he loved that back and forth. Um, he liked it more than Dick did, I think. I think Dick actually got sort of worked up about it. I think Jim enjoyed the two-way on it. Um, but the last three, four years when he felt that he didn't have an audience, when the only way he could get out was by going online, like he did, and creating his own blog. I'm still learning what a blog is. In a sense, that old man creating the first blog in the field, you see what a young mind he had. And he had that to the very end. And he knew it, and he could talk about it. You know, He could talk about the body going, but <laughs> didn't want the mind to go with it, and it didn't. And um, he remained a remarkable character to the very end. Yeah, we have to stop.